Welcome to Fun with Annuities, where every single week I welcome a celebrity guest expert that can help you maximize chapter two of your life. Listen, learn, laugh, and love every minute of the most unique financial podcast on the planet. Let's get to it. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's Annuity Agent, licensed in all 50 states. We have a brand new guest on today, and he's he's going to be back numerous times. Um, Just an absolute superstar. His resume was unbelievable. I mean, just give you some highlights. I'm going to go through everything because I want to get to topics, and we'll have uh, a lot on him. Uh, He'll have his own page like all of our celebrity guests do, but He's a lawyer. He's he's a finance professor. He's just an all around unbelievably smart person. But today's topic is going to be interesting because we're going to talk about money in all different forms. I would like to welcome Jay Zawatsky to the program. Jay, so 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 happy that you're here. Welcome. Thank you, Stan. I appreciate being here. Uh, I appreciate also the opportunity to discuss with your audience some simple framing devices uh, because what I really am most interested in is having people, particularly those who are young, and I know most of your audience is probably in the 50 and over, probably 50 and over, but we, I mean, our audience is growing by leaps and bounds. We're one of the fastest financial podcasts, growth podcasts in 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 the country. And I think it's because we bring on smart people and it's not salesy. We don't sell anything. We're talking about, you know, like today, we're talking about money. We're digging in. So with that being said, I'm going to give the floor to you and just just listen to what what you have to say to our audience, because this is valuable stuff. So go jump in anytime. Certainly. Um, When I'm teaching my personal finance classes to a wide range of people, and I, I like to teach at community colleges because that's where the real people are. People at Harvard and Brown, from which I graduated many, many, many years ago, don't need this kind of help. They have experts who work mm-hmm. for them. Correct. But average folks who uh, actually get dirt under their fingernails uh, are the kinds of people that I want to help. And I want to help them reach a retirement that will uh, satisfy their every desire. And the only way to get to a retirement that satisfies your every desire is to understand basically what money is and what it should be. Now, when I teach my classes, I introduce a easy framing topic, uh, which is good money versus bad money. Good money is money that acts as both a battery and a time machine. If you have money that can store the value of your labor, then you have one aspect of good money. But the second one is more important than even the first. And that is, can it preserve its purchasing power over long spans of time? And over the grand sweep of history, there have been only a few good monies that have been able to accomplish both being a battery and a time machine. And the one that has survived everything, every change, every generation, every war, every cataclysm, there's only one. And it's called gold, G-O-L-D. It's not Bitcoin. It's not Dogecoin. (laughs) It's not the U.S. fiat dollar. It's not anything that is emanated by a printing press. Because printing press money, also known as ex nihilo money, meaning out of nothingness, can be printed at the whim of the government and we've seen that we've seen that in the last couple of years we've just printed what are we printed 30 percent more money than we had well what one uh interesting statistic is that 
uh, from the beginning of the Republic in 1789, remember the Constitution is when the Republic began, and that was uh, in effect as of uh, 1789. From 1789 until 2008, the total emanation of currency by the United States government was $800 billion, not even $1 trillion. Since 19, excuse me, since 2008, the reserve, uh, excuse me, the balance of the Federal Reserve uh, has gone up by a factor of 10. 10 times more money has been created, ex nihilo, out of nothingness, uh, in the last 13, 14 years than were created in the first 200 plus years of the United States. That gives you some understanding of the valuelessness of the fiat dollar. Now, Stan, I, Stan, I sent you uh, an interesting uh, slide that I use in my classes, and I constantly update this slide. And I don't know if you're going to be able to. We're going to put that on, on your page so people will be able to access that, not a okay. problem. Now, what this slide describes is two points in time. One is 1915, when an individual could purchase a Model T automobile for the grand sum uh, of $825. Now, $825 back in those days was worth 42 ounces of gold. Now, let's fast forward to 2022. Uh, December 16th, to be more exact. I checked just before you started to record this, and the price of one ounce of gold was $1,787. And if you converted that to the equivalent of the car, now let's take the Model T in 1915. It had very few uh, bells and whistles, but let's say Today's equivalent thereof would be a 2022 Honda LX Accord. That car can be purchased for cash for $28,206. I checked with a local dealer just before uh, recording time. So that's $28,206 divided by $1,787, which is exactly 15.87 ounces of gold. So you could have purchased a Model T for 42 ounces of gold it, all the way back in uh, 1915. Uh, but if you had simply taken, or your great-grandfather had taken, and let's say buried in the backyard 42 ounces of gold, and with a treasure map for you to dig up uh, when you were, say, 30 years old, uh, and you take the money, you take the gold uh, down to the uh, Honda dealership, and you'd be able to buy not one, not two, but two point X Honda Accords. Now that's what I call preservation of purchasing power. If you had tried to take the same $825, uh, you wouldn't even get the steering wheel. Now others would say, well, yes, but you would have invested your $825 and it would have earned interest. That is a true statement. But how much interest and how many times would that $825 have compounded at the interest rate that was available? So if you were to take a 3% interest rate, which has been the average mm -hmm. uh, treasury bill interest rate over that span of time, and then acknowledge that that would be taxable as you received it on an annual basis, say you put it in one year treasury bills and just kept rolling them forward, uh, you would have doubled the amount of money every 24 years, because via the rule of 72, mm -hmm. very simple to calculate how often your money will double at a particular interest rate. If you take 72 and divide by three, that's 24. That means it takes 24 years for any sum of money invested at 3% to double. So how many doublings have there been essentially over 100 years? Well, that would mean that it would have, if 24 uh, years to double, roughly uh, four doublings. So if you started out with 
825. Let's just round it up to 1,000. 1,000. First doubling, 2,000. Second doubling, 4,000. Third doubling, 8,000. Fifth doubling, 16,000. For $16,000, and that assumes you don't have to pay any taxes on the interest that you receive. But let's just say you had in a tax-free account, which in those days didn't exist. But say it did. You would not have enough money to buy even a single Honda Accord at 28206 But if you had simply, without any risk whatsoever, you just dig it up from the backyard that your great-grandfather buried, you would have not only preserved your purchasing power, but you would have magnified your purchasing power. So what's the takeaway? I mean, one of the things that you told me the other day, I think it was, is how much gold had been actually produced and taken out of the ground. And it was such a small amount that I literally was, I gasped. I'm like, what? It wasn't it like a Olympic sized swimming pool? Didn't you tell me that? Well, they're actually since the beginning of time. See, nobody throws gold away. Gold is always reclaimed because it has so much purchasing value. Right. And it's distinct. Uh the total amount of gold ever mined in all of human history ever ever is it is totals 180 maybe 1000 metric tons that's it now given the specific uh, density of gold that's enough gold to fill up two olympic sized swimming pools so when you think about uh you know phelps flying down uh the that's lane that's incredible and uh, and underneath him there would be like Scrooge McDuck. You remember uh, Scrooge? He, he he liked to swim around in his gold. <laughs> well, just picture Michael Phelps, you know, doing his butterfly in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and you can kind of get the sense of how little gold there actually is in the world. Now, that gold, uh, if you were to convert all of it to a modern amount of money, uh, would be able to serve as it as the base for all money produced today. The problem would be is that the price of gold worldwide converted to U.S. dollars would have to be you know thirty to forty thousand dollars per ounce. So if anybody ever decided to return to a gold standard, then gold would have to be remonetized to make the number of fiat currency units. And the number of ounces of gold equivalent, roughly thirty to forty thousand dollars per ounce. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, I mean, that's a great foundation to start with. So I'm, I'm assuming my podcast listeners and the people that are watching on all major podcast platforms, thank you, and the fun with the Nudies YouTube channel, they're asking, "Okay, got it. Problem. All right, Jay, what's the solution, or is there one?" I mean, what are you thinking here based upon that foundation, based upon some gasping for air realities of how much has been mined? I know we're in trouble <laughs> as, from monetary wise. What are you thinking? What are you proposing? What's your solutions? Well, you have to understand that uh, the general public doesn't understand what money is. So we've tried to give an explanation of what sure. good money is, but unfortunately we're plagued with bad money, bad money that is uh, emanated ex nihilo without from nothingness. That's Bitcoin in a nutshell. I happen to agree with that. Um, Bitcoin is just another form of fiat because you can create as many bit currencies as you choose. And they have, there's 7,000. Right, and most of them will go to zero. And I believe that eventually Bitcoin will go to zero because Bitcoin is only crypto 1.0. What, right. what happened to Betamax, uh, <laughs> Sony's Betamax, when VCR <laughs> came out? It went to zero. Uh, and then uh, that technology went to zero when right. uh, the next thing came out. Now we have Netflix and we have all of these things uh, that are digital. Or, or think of MySpace when inter internet started. MySpace and and um, you know all of that stuff that was that was the hottest thing. I mean, you don't even they, they're not on the radar screen. I do agree with you, and I do agree with Warren Buffett that you know he said I wouldn't give twenty five dollars for the whole lot of it. 
And I do think the 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 latest um, FTX issue, you know, innocent to till proven guilty, but it looks pretty bad for this kid. I think it's going to unwind from here, and I think it's going to be pretty ugly. Do you agree with that on the Bitcoin side? Well, there are two elements that you have or to crypto? and distinguish between all of these cr various cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Blockchain sure. technology is incredibly valuable. Fantastic. I totally agree with that. And eventually, it will you know, be the basis of uh, legal contracts, mm -hmm. uh, medical records. Uh, legal records. Uh, right, I exactly. totally agree, 100%. But as far as the use of it for a currency, the problem with Bitcoin right now is that it has raised the ire of governments worldwide. Mm -hmm. As a result, governments are going to destroy it and they're going to come out with the central bank digital currency, which is the worst thing in terms of privacy that could ever happen to anybody. I agree, Any because they'll be able to tax us real time. Not just tax you, but look what happened to those poor truckers, the freedom truckers up in Canada. You know, they wanted to help uh, a particular group of people uh, make a point. They're supposed to have freedom of speech in Canada. Uh, but the Canadian government said, oh, no, you know, if you help the freedom truckers, we're going to go in and seize your money. Right. Now, imagine if they had control of every uh, currency unit under your so-called ownership. They'd be able to go in and say, you can't have access to your money until you recant, until you, you know, become a double plus good duck speaker, you know, in the Orwellian frame. I would frame. love to do that. That's where, I mean, and this isn't conspiracy theory stuff. This is common sense, rational, pragmatic thinking and linear thinking on where this could go and it could be a problem. I've always said from the start that cryptocurrency is the government's dream if they could control it because there would never be an April 15th again. They would just tax us every day, every day. They would be able to, you know, increase or decrease taxes, you know, at will. Correct. Uh, and they would be able to target specific people for additional taxation based on your lifestyle. Suppose, uh, you know, you were a little overweight and they decided that you had gotten too many medical services and they see that you're trying to charge something at McDonald's and it's a Big Mac quarter pounder or whatever those Holy things are called. Mackerel. You're not going to be able to get that. Sorry, no Big Macs for you, you know, like on uh, Seinfeld. No so let's, for you. Let's, let's go back. Because, you know, this is a solutions podcast. So we're talking about money and we're talking about 11,000 baby boomers hitting 65 every single day. And most of the people listening to this podcast have either retired, thinking about retirement, planning on retirement, trying to spell the word retirement. Um, what, what's, all right, Jay. What's the what solution for that? No, no, what's the, no, there's no perfect solutions, just bad sales pitches. You know that. But what's the thought? And the um, from your end on, OK, people are going toward retirement. What should they do to hopefully help and enhance that, that retirement based upon the foundation you just laid out? Right. Well, I can I can tell you what I do in my own personal. Well, let's do life. that. Let's do that. What I have done in order to preserve my retirement. Okay. I recognized a long time ago that fiat money was bad money, as we've been talking about for the last many minutes. Mm hmm. And I also realized that gold was good money. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've based my retirement on a barbell approach. I have a substantial uh, percentage of my assets in gold and silver. And by the way, I do not keep those uh, in the United States. I keep the now, silver in the U.S. Now, let me ask you a question, because once, once you start saying that, we have to be dis very specific, because as you know, and as as my listeners know, there's there's gold mutual funds, there's gold ETFs, there's actually hard gold you you ha hold in your hand. There's gold coins. Dig in and throw the dart at exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, um, there are uh, many ways to own physical allocated bullion uh, in an offshore account, which is perfectly safe. Uh, not held by a government, but held by a private entity who is audited on a monthly basis. And there are many uh, such services where you can convert 
uh, your currency units, wherever you happen to may be on earth, dollars or Canadian dollars or pounds mm -hmm. or euros or what have you, into physical bullion in a completely allocated account. That means that they're not, it's not commingled. You actually own that uh bullion that has been allocated and you're talking about gold hard just gold that you can pick up and put back down we're not talking about etfs or funds or all the stuff that's being pitched out there gold coins and you know the guy on tv etc we're talking about gold bullion correct that's correct now it can be in the form of gold bullion coins if you happen to want to have them that way uh but the easiest thing to do is to get allocated physical bullion, typically in small bars, which are held in your name uh, offshore. Now, why do I say offshore? Because the United States government in 1933 confiscated gold other than jewelry. Uh, I remember hearing from my grandfather, uh, who was a young entrepreneur at the time, and he happened to have uh, 10 uh, gold coins in his safety deposit box at a local bank where he lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and where he owned a small business. Mm -hmm. And along comes uh, FDR, and he issues these famous executive order uh, stating that within five months, uh, every single ounce of gold uh, held by Americans would be confiscated. And uh, one day, my grandfather went to the bank to uh, put an insurance policy into his safety deposit box, and they, uh, the bank manager said, oh, you can't go in there unless this fellow goes in with you. My grandfather says, well, who's that? He said, oh, he's from the Internal Revenue Service. And he said, why? He says, well, they need to see if you have any gold coins or any gold bars. And my grandfather said, well, I do have some gold coins. And at this point, you know, the IRS guy's ears pricked up. And he said, OK, let's go get them. So they went back there and my grandfather gave him the key and the bank manager had the other key and they turned the locks and they pulled out the drawer. And indeed, there were 10 gold coins. They were $20 gold pieces. So the IRS guy hands my grandfather cash uh, of $200. And my grandfather takes the cash and he hands it to the bank manager and says, would you please deposit this into my account? The guy was happy to do it. But a few months later, when FDR had confiscated all the gold, which added up to 261 million ounces of gold, making the United States government now the proud owner of the largest hoard of gold in the history of the planet, uh, that turned out to be more gold than had ever been assembled in any place at any one time. And then what he did in order to... Sorry about that. What what he did uh, in order to uh, increase, uh, or or I should say, increase the money supply, was simply change the value of gold overnight from twenty dollars and seventy seven cents per ounce to thirty five dollars. That was an immediate seventy percent, not seventeen, seven zero, seventy percent devaluation. Uh, in what you owned before, because they took the gold from you at $20. And then they said, oh, too bad. The government now owns it. And we're deeming it to be worth $35. Dumb question. Is that where the, I mean, and, and all of us out here probably think, because we're not up to speed on it like you are, the Fort Knox gold that we all know about as kids and people talked about, is that where that came from? There is no... Uh, material amount of gold at Fort Knox. The biggest amount of gold there is, is 100 floors below uh, ground level in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. That's where all the gold is kept. And there are rooms down there. And each uh, major country has a room. And when gold is exchanged among countries, it's transacted there. Uh, so let's say that uh, Canada wants to pay some gold to France. Uh, they just move it uh, from the French room, uh, it, excuse me, it, from the Canadian In the bowels room. of New York City. That's correct. Uh, now, many, <laughs> many, countries, many countries have decided to repatriate their gold because they don't trust the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, there's an interesting story, and it's very um, didactic for people to understand. When the United States, until 1933, uh, it was perfectly legal to own gold, and gold was coins, as were mm -hmm. silver. Uh, and then they made gold coins uh, illegal. They confiscated them all. But gold was still the standard by which dollar values were measured, meaning gold was uh, worth $35 an ounce. And all international trade uh, was based on gold at $35 an ounce. Now, in 1968, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who needed to uh, both pay for the Great Society and the Vietnam War simultaneously, his famous mm -hmm. guns and butter approach to geopolitics, realized that he couldn't raise taxes on the American public anymore. He had already put through uh, a 10 cent uh, per dollar, 10 percent surtax the year before, and he realized that it wasn't enough. So he decided to reduce what they call the reserve requirement, uh, where every dollar had to be backed by 40 percent gold, he reduced it down to 25 percent, which allowed him to increase the money supply dramatically. And then it, on March 19th, 1968, what he did was he completely eliminated the reserve requirement for gold, which, you know, was shocking to people who truly understand understood it at the time. But 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet didn't know what any of that meant. But what the result of it was, was that the dollar was no longer linked to gold. So politicians on both sides of the aisle had a free shot. You know, one party would say, oh, we're for uh, social justice. We're going to spend all this money on that. Another party would say, oh, we're for a big, strong defense. And they would spend a bunch of money on that. And the way that they did it was they borrowed. And once nobody would loan money to the government anymore, the Federal Reserve would buy up all the bonds with newly ex nihilo created money. That's why we're in the position we're in today. In order for a human being to have something of value, you have to work for it. And that work is represented by, let's call it a gold coin. You know, for every, let's say you make $100,000 a year uh, at $2,000 per coin, uh, you would have, you would be able to earn a certain number of coins. And those coins are like a certificate. But, but of let me play devil's advocate because yeah. I think the history lesson is in place. The world goes to hell in a handbasket. You have gold and you want to go buy bread. How do you go buy bread? I mean, what's the pragmatic approach? You hold gold bullion. Now what? Very good question. And that's why everybody should pair their gold bullion with silver bullion coins. Pre-1965, what's called junk silver uh, or modern day uh, minted uh, gold uh, one ounce coins, either Canadian Maple Leafs or U.S. Eagles, because you can spend those. Let's say uh, today with silver at about twenty three dollars uh, an ounce, a, a, a silver coin is, let's say, worth twenty five dollars because you got the minting costs. You can use that for, for purchasing gasoline. You can use that for purchasing uh, food at the grocery store. And uh, people will recognize those things and they would understand that that's value. Uh, so big money that you save for retirement that you never want to take a long-term inflationary risk with, you hold offshore in... Uh, but that, but that sounds, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to push back because that's my job. Um, first of all, it sounds very complicated to the normal person. And second of all, you know, people don't, uh, most people don't have the money to put offshore. They need it liquid. They need it around, et cetera. I mean, I just read an article of the day that 65% um, of the public, regardless of what kind of money they make or live in paycheck to paycheck, obviously we're not talking to those people. We're talking to the other people who I deem as, you know, the savers, the scrimpers, the people that have put together a base of money um, without going in, you know, because I think you might be losing some people here on offshore. It just seems too, too, too far-fetched for a lot of people. How do you bring it down to 
the common person that wants to take advantage of this type of pragmatic thinking, but they want to do it on a simple level. Can you bring it down to that level? You start with silver coins. That's how you start. Okay. Because silver and gold kind of dance around one another uh, in terms of value. Silver is more of an industrial metal than gold. Gold has a few industrial uses, but it's mostly uh, for jewelry and also, most importantly, as the base of money. But silver uh, has an increased number of industrial uses on a daily basis. There's already 60,000 different uses for silver. Uh, and it's becoming uh, more scarce in the Earth's crust because we've mined out quite but, a... But what's the percentage of... Yeah, you're pounding the table right now, and you're saying to the listeners and viewers, you really need gold bullion some, in some part of your portfolio. You really need real silver coins. What's mm -hmm. that percentage? Right. Well, Not well, Jay Zawatsky yeah, percentages, well, I, but normal human people yeah. like me. I, I would say that the appropriate... It, why do you want to hold this? You want to hold it in case there's an emergency, and you mm -hmm. also want to hold it in order to protect yourself from inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, uh, you would need between 10 and 15% of your liquid uh, assets, your nice. liquid net worth in gold slash silver. Uh, if you have a low net worth- and Once again, you're not talking about gold funds and gold ETFs and 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 I say that the the name I'm getting ready to say I I I I listen to his podcast, but he's always pushing his gold funds and and ETFs as Peter Schiff. Nothing against Peter Schiff. I think he's a very smart man, but he's pushing gold mutual funds and gold management. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about gold bullion and silver coins you can hold in your hand, right? Right. I happen to know Peter Schiff, and I know that he also does provide a, a mechanism for the actual purchase of silver and gold coins. Good. I didn't know that. Okay. In fact, I have purchased uh, some of my uh, silver and gold coins from his company. And I um, recommend people to listen to his podcast as well, the Peter Schiff, S-C-H-I-F-F right. podcast, because just like Jay... He is a believer in the gold story, for lack of a better phrase. He he understands it. I don't. I'm not sure he understands it as well as Jay does. But he's one of the few people that I've heard, other than Jay, talk about it rationally, seriously. Um, and you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, well, you must be a crazy prepper or whatever." It, it's not that at all. It's being prepared for a future that many people. Hope never happens. But either way, there was no great calamity in America between 1915 and uh, 2022. 20, uh, but gold still retained its value, as I indicated on that Honda to uh, on the uh, the Model T and the Honda chart. Uh, so even if nothing bad ever happens, it is a perfect way because of its scarcity in the world. We already talked about it. there's only two Olympic sized swimming pools full of That's it. That's the best visual I've ever heard on gold, ever. And you also told me something as well about pounding out gold and making it flat. You told me another, tell that, tell that stat. Sure. That's an interesting one, too. Well, one of the elements that make gold true money, um, you know, it's durable uh, and it's divisible. Uh, you can take one ounce of 24 karat gold, which is 100% gold, and you can put it on a table, a large table with a mallet, and you can smash it down into essentially uh, a tiny film. It's called gold leaf. And you can get 300 square feet of gold leaf from a single ounce of gold. 300 is, square feet. 300 square feet of gold leaf per one ounce of 24 karat pure gold. That's incredible. That and that's what was used to adorn uh, temples and sure. Christ, uh, Christian churches. And uh, you name the, uh, the religion, they've used it throughout, you know, pan religion. All religions have had an affinity with gold because it's precious, it's rare, and it has unique qualities. Uh, but for the average person, just knowing that they have something that over the grand sweep of time is, you don't, it's not fine art. Uh, you don't have to spend, you know, $100,000 to buy, you know, a, a fancy painting. And you can't divide that painting 
Because if you do, now someone would say, oh, well, now we have NFTs and we can tokenize it. Well, <laughs> as soon as there's a power failure, what's your token worth? Exactly. Uh, but if you own physical objects, then you are okay. Uh, because I think the big takeaway from this for me is 10% up to 15%. Obviously, you want to do more. That's your poison. But what Jay's saying, 10 to 15%, you need to probably consider, according to Jay, into gold or silver, correct? Okay. What's another takeaway for the listeners and viewers based upon, you know, your research and education and how right. just how you view the world? Well, I mentioned earlier that I that I personally use the barbell. Well, I've described one of the bars on the barbell, which is gold and silver as mm -hmm. one of the big uh, ways to preserve yourself. The other one is, and a lot of people are going to be shocked when I say this, but the other one is cash and cash equivalents. Now, when I say cash, I'm not talking about green money that you put in a jar and stick it up on uh, your shelf. No, I'm talking about um, short-term ladders of two types. One type is treasury bills mm -hmm. that go up to you know eight week, 13 week, six sure. month, one year, ladder them. The benefit of treasury bills is that you're going to get whatever the current rate of return is, and you won't have to pay taxes on a state basis. They're not, it, interest on a treasury bill is not taxable at the state level. If you live in Florida, you don't care. But if you live in Maryland, like I do, where it's 8.3%, it makes a big deal. Absolutely. The other, and the other way to employ your cash is with the MIGAs. Uh, there's nothing better than a multi-year guaranteed annuity He's not being can, paid for this, everyone, right. by the way. And I don't own any right now. You don't own any right now. <laughs> right. But I believe that because of the tax advantage nature of MIGAs, they beat deposits at banks. They beat sure. certificates of deposit at banks. They are, next to treasuries, the best possible way to invest. And I call it an investment because you are getting a rate of return Contractual. On that money. That is correct. And if you get a rate of return and it is tax advantaged, and then you can keep rolling those MIGAs over at whatever the then current rate is, which is going to uh, reflect whatever the perceived inflation is over the next two to five years, then you can eventually convert that tax free, you know, via a 1035 exchange mm -hmm. into an annuity, a single premium or sure deferred. for lifetime income. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked that Mike at Aspia. Is that the uh, is that is there a, another barbell to your plan? Well, those are the two bells, those, those are the two the, big, the big ones. Bells. Then along the skinny rod are other types of. Uh, savings slash investments. Gotcha. Now, I um, do not always have investments in stocks. I use what's called the Dow Gold Ratio to determine when to get out of stocks and when to get into stocks. And it's very simple and it always works over time. There's never been an exception to this. Okay. But it's not, it's not trading in and out. It is looking at what the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average is compared to the price of an ounce of gold. When the Dow Jones Industrial Average is, say, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 times the value of an ounce of gold, that's the time to get out of stocks and buy gold. And then when, when that ratio gets down to five or less, it's time to sell 90% of your gold, keep holding some, just in case. Mm -hmm. And then you get into dividend paying stocks. And when I say dividend paying stocks, I'm specifically talking about dividend kings, dividend aristocrats. Uh, Legacy stocks, big stocks. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, that, that, that have that's very, that's very fascinating. Stocks. I've heard versions of that, but not put as succinctly and simply as you, as you have done. And I think that's a, that's really, really good advice let me ask you a couple of just general questions. You know, sure. when you see Chairman Chairman Powell prance up to the to the mic, do you just laugh? Is he? Is this? No, I cry. Thing? Or I you cry? cry. Okay. <laughs> because you under you have to understand when the U.S. abandoned the gold standard, they went on what I refer to as the Ph.D. standard. 
And that means that it violates uh, reality. Uh, as we as we learned from a very simple essay written by Leonard Reed back in the 1950s, and everybody should read this or watch the modern uh, video on it. It's called I, the letter I, comma, pencil, P-E-N-C-I-L, I pencil. If you have never read or viewed I pencil, then you have missed out on the greatest uh, education. Give a synopsis. Give a give an elevator speech on it. I can do it in one phrase. Do it. There is no mastermind. There is not a single human being who can even make a pencil. You, th there is nobody who has all of the cr the ability to combine the resources to get the resources, or has the capability of making a number two Eberhard pencil from the eraser to the little you know uh, brass band they call the ferrule down to the slats down to the graphite in the middle those materials come from all over the planet the graphite comes from Sri Lanka uh, the wooden slats come from uh, tall trees in the in the Pacific Northwest the eraser is a mixture of uh, lots of various chemicals. The ferrule comes from, you know, tin and copper to make the brass from all over the planet. They all have to be combined, and there's not a single person in the who's ever lived who could make one of those on their own. But the somehow they exist. Why do they exist? Because we have the price system, and uh, we have markets. And the markets are balanced by the price system. Now, why did I go into this? Because the price system has been destroyed by the PhDs, the, our, our you know, sociopathic overlords at the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, who then do the bidding of their political masters. Mm -hmm. uh, and they think they're smarter than the market. Nobody is smarter than the market. What you have to do is understand what the market is and how to participate in it. And you take what the market gives you and you run away from the market when it goes against you. Right. Um, and that's, that's the best way to preserve your wealth over a long period of time. Jay Powell is uh, not an economist. He's, he's a lawyer um, who was born in the Washington area, has lived in the Washington area his whole life. He's never had a, quote, real job. He's got no dirt under his fingernails. He doesn't shop at Walmart. He doesn't, you know, dine at, uh, you know, uh, casual dining. Uh, he's a very, very wealthy guy because he's been completely plugged in his whole life. Sure. He serves his political masters and his political masters are the guys, you know, the super elite, the globalists who, you know, have created this system for their own benefit. Let's face it, who gets the money first when it's created by the Federal Reserve? The big banks. Sure. And what do they do with it? They loan it to their buddies. And they, they're able to acquire the assets before the inflation sets in. And then all the rest of us are left dealing with inflation uh, and, and the fruits of their failure to labor on our behalf. That's what's going on. Um, and he serves them as they all have. Ben Bernanke finally admitted in 2010 that in addition to the two mandates of the Federal Reserve, the first one, which was a good mandate, was to provide liquidity for good collateral. That's why the Federal Reserve was created, so that if there was a run on a bank, the bank could call up the local Federal Reserve branch and say, there's a run on the bank, and the chairman of the local branch of, of the Federal Reserve would say, all right, send us down your good collateral, meaning you know your good house loans, your good sure. uh, auto loans, et cetera, and we will pay you 80% of the value of those. We'll swap it, and then people will see there's money in your bank, and the bank run will end. Uh, it's sort of like what happened in that movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Then the second uh, mandate was given by Congress after the war. It was to maintain full employment. Well, those two things don't work together uh, because you can either 
maintain the value of the dollar, or you can facilitate uh, Keynesian economics, which means uh, increase employment, decrease mm -hmm. employment by using the tools of the Federal Reserve, sure. which, which are all blunt instruments. But in, in 2010, Ben Bernanke created a third mandate, all on his own. And that mandate was, uh, let's create the wealth effect. And he even wrote an article that was published in the Washington Post where he admitted it. He says, I am going to do what it takes to create a wealth effect so that people will think they're rich and spend more money and that will save the economy. Well, it didn't work because all we got out of that was bubble, 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 and the bubbles are going to turn to trouble and they're beginning to crack now. Uh, let's, stop, that, let's stop right there because sure. we're going to kind of close this up, but I want to... Um, let's kind of close out with predictions, whether they be gloom and doom, it is what it is. I need your brain here and I need you to be honest with my listeners and viewers about where we're headed in your opinion. And then you've already given them some good ideas on how to hedge that. But, but what's your opinion here as a country, um, going into at the time of this taping, um, you know, we're getting close to 2023. Where do you see 2023 and 2024? What's that look like to you? It all depends on one thing. If America once again becomes an energy powerhouse, as it was fairly recently, mm -hmm. we will be able to save America. If we do not, uh, then we will fail as a country, meaning we will become Venezuela, Argentina, uh, we will become a third world kind of country. When people so, hear you say that, because we're all patriotic to to probably to a fault in a lot of cases, you're not you're not kidding around. You you really think that it's we're that teetering that close if things don't happen correctly, right? Right. Well, society is already split um, into two uh, metaphysically warring camps. Let's hope it never comes to the other kind of warring camp. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I pray every day that that doesn't happen. Yeah. Me uh, too. Now, the problem is that we have changed policies and we have taken a turn that we are trying to reach some kind of new energy nirvana before the technology is there. Mm -hmm. So they're changing these policies and then stripping out our ability to have cheap, affordable power. Um, and it may take 40 years for there to actually be clean, cheap reliable energy. And that will come from one of two sources. And there are only two that can do it. One is fusion, which is who knows whether that's ever going to come. And the other one is eventually the hydrogen economy. Mm -hmm. That is conceivable if they start investing the money properly. Uh, because hydrogen, unlike fossil fuels, has no CO2 component to it. Now, I personally don't believe that man uh, is the cause of so-called global warming, if that exists. But that's for a whole different. Yeah, know. that's our next. That's our next podcast. Yeah. Let me do this when we got to close it up. But with every celebrity guest host um, at the very end, I do what's called a mic drop moment, which means that I'm going to count you down from five, and then I'm going to hand you the mic. You're going to say something within about a one to two minute close to close this thing out, and then we'll close it out from there. So here we go, mic drop moment. Jay Zawatsky, one of the smartest dudes on the planet. <laughs> you probably you probably can't believe what you just heard, and he will be on again. So here's the mic drop moment in five, four, three, two, one, go. Well, Stan, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet your audience. Um, I do hope to come back and talk about a number of other topics. But you see that hat I have on? It says, save, comma, America. Yeah, for the people that are on the podcast platforms listening in your car, it's, he's wearing a red hat that's not the red hat you think, but it says, save America. So go. Right. And it says, save, comma, America, meaning this is my uh, imploring you to do one thing for yourself. Because remember, you're supposed to pay yourself first, always. The basic rule of personal finance, the reason they call it personal finance, is that you are supposed to uh, care about yourself. If you care about yourself and your family, the rest will take care of it. And the only way to ultimately take care of you, yourself, and your family is to save because the only thing that can get you 
from day one to day thousand and one and day hundred thousand and one uh, for your you know children and grandchildren is to save. And the way you save is using the barbell approach. Use gold and silver on one end, use cash, uh, short-term cash investments, including you know treasuries and migas. And the other thing you have to do is constantly read. You must read all the time. Don't spend your time on TikTok. Don't spend your time on Netflix. Read the classics. And Stan, if, if you want me to, I can provide you with a list of three simple starter books that are accessible to anybody with an eighth grade plus education. Yeah, email me that list and we'll get it to you. And Jay, let me tell you something. Let me close with this. You know, when I invite guests on and my PR firm does a very good job finding superstars like Jay, but I never, never, ever know what's going to happen. I never know if they're good or talented. And I'm just going to say this right now. That was incredible. And, and if you've listened to this podcast a lot and we've been on for a long, long time, that was one of the best things I've ever heard. And I'm looking forward to having Jay on. He is an absolute rock star. And, it, you know, when I hear people like Jay, I'm I'm always amazed that he's not on CNBC and he's not on Fox Business. And, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, but that's the reason this podcast exists. And it exists to find the smartest people in the world to talk about other things other than annuities that will help you in life and in retirement and with your lifestyle and to hedge against crazy things that are happening in this world, whether it be political, whatever you, however you want to frame it. But I'm just proud to have him on, have him on. And I really want to thank every single person out there on all the major podcast platforms and the fun with annuities, YouTube channel. So glad you join us. And we're going to continue to bring this type of talent on. Thank you so much for joining us. I will see you next time.